Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Manufacturing Diversity Symposium, which focuses on advanced computer-aided manufacturing processes and material technologies in architecture. As is typical for the AA, we start with a rather small audience in the morning, and the room will probably fill up as we go along. However, um, I think we have quite an illustrious audience today with guests from Norway and from Italy, respectively, uh, and our speakers, uh, of course, from Germany and from Netherlands. So in that sense, it is uh, quite interesting to have you all here. This symposium, uh, which is organized by Mike Weinstock, Achim Menges, and myself, is a collaboration between the Emergent Technologies Design Program and uh, technical studies at the AA, with, <coughs> with the aim to discuss a number of questions relative to the topic, which I shall briefly introduce, but also with the aim to produce um, an article for a follow-up to the AD magazine uh, Emergence Morphogenetic Design Strategies that Mike Achim and I guest edited. Um, just as a very short introduction, I would just like to say that one of the predominant contemporary uh, preoccupations that is that architecture as a material practice is changing quite rapidly and that the trend is going towards a built environment that is becoming much more diverse than in the days of mass production and building elements and systems. Now, that is a question. Um, it's a question to challenge today, to see whether that is a contemporary <coughs> cliche or uh, what we can say more specifically about that. Key concepts that underlie this preoccupation are, uh, for instance, versioning or variation, leading to families of varied building elements and systems that are similar in degree, together with an increasingly integral interrelation between uh, building elements and systems that are different in kind. Both of these approaches, so has it the contemporary cliche, are driven by performance characteristics and requirements of these elements and systems, their behavior in an environment. The agenda of performative design will be investigated soon in another symposium. That is not so much the issue today. But the issue today is um, to test and verify the assumption that building elements and systems are in fact becoming more varied and to see what might drive this trend, namely uh, closely related design and manufacturing approaches together with the facilitating expertise <coughs> and enabling technology. Um, the symposium introduces a variety of approaches to manufacturing and material technologies in the building sector. Um, of leading companies to facilitate the construction of some of the most innovative and exciting building designs. To name a few, the Allianz Arena in Munich by Herzog de Moron, or the Prada store in Omote Sandodori in Tokyo, or the Seattle Library by OMA, or for instance, the Expo Pavilion uh, by Thomas Herzog with particular uh, respect to the roof structure. Uh, the representatives of the involved manufacturing companies will present their specific approaches to complex design and production tasks enabled by advanced computer-aided manufacturing processes and knowledge and skills related to that. Just to say one <coughs> quick word about the um, uh, schedule for today. The schedule of today is not so much organized by building systems and materials rather than by flight schedules and by um, uh, business meetings, which you will hopefully understand because those people that we represent today are somehow very sought after by the leading architectural practices here in London as well, and they have obviously their very important commitments. So I'm really, really happy that we're able to introduce this fantastic round of uh, speakers. The first speaker will be Michael Keller from FinForest, followed by Karel Jan Follers, uh, who will present uh, not his own work, or rather his collaboration with a company called Octatube in uh, Delft. Um, then we had to switch in the schedule. Then uh, Mr. Benoit Fauchon from Covertex will present. Then we will have a short lunch break. Once we reconvene, Thomas Spitzer from Seele will present, and then Mr. Dirk Emmer from Skyspan. After that, we will have a podium discussion. and. Uh, Usually what happens in these kind of events is after the first, after the last presentation, everybody rushes out. And that's why I would like to entice you a little bit and uh, tease you with some of the questions that we would like to raise so that uh, you might actually wish to 
participate in that debate later on in this discussion. Questions will range from uh, exchange between manufacturers and architects and designers uh, in the process between design and the making and assembly of buildings. Questions will go into the realm of what drives and limits the differentiation of building systems from a technological point of view and from a knowledge point of view. Third, we will test the contemporary myth of the continuous data set. Uh, is it actually really true that uh, some files produced by the architects are directly forwarded to uh, manufacturing technologies, which uh, should be a really interesting question for uh, the audience to uh, somehow get some insights into. Uh, other questions will relate to the specialization or versatility in the consideration of purchasing technologies and tools by these companies. What is really important? Um, is the trend more towards specialization or more towards uh, a broader scope of tasks that can be fulfilled by the investment in technologies? And also the contribution of the new manufacturing approaches and technologies above and beyond the efficiency of production. What else do we actually gain from these ways of working? So having said that, I would just like to very briefly introduce the first speaker, Mr. Michael Keller uh, from FinForest Merck. Um, I think he will tell you something about the company. Uh, if I uh, know that correctly, he has been involved since 1987 with the company and uh, is today the director of pan-European uh, project business in the FinForest Corporation, which makes him travel to exciting places such as Finland today. <laughs> and um, with um, this in mind and with uh, the kind of versatility of the uh, production and work of Merck that most of you are already familiar with because Mr. Uh, Keller has already presented uh, the work here quite frequently, I pass <coughs> it over to him. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. There are still some coming in. Welcome. Uh, I'm quite happy that uh, you are interested <laughs> and you are here so early. Maybe there are some missing, especially the people that uh, went at the Grimshaw's party yesterday. They might be a little bit tired. I was also there, but I stopped early enough. So let's talk about manufacturing diversity and especially in the case of timber. Timber has its own structural beauty and I would like to show you what we think about how to deal especially with timber as a fascinating building material and how to make it work. Our idea and this is the structure of our overall company, FinForest today has its own PFC and FSC managed forests mainly in Finland, where we get out some raw material, sawn timber, plywood, glulam, other materials where we can produce components, where we can produce systems to be used in the building industry. And at the end, we are able today to go for combined concepts and project business. The technology we are using today is quite state of the art uh, and it has developed over the last 10 years very much. The timber business today is different to the timber business it was 10 years ago. We are using today a lot of derived timber products, uh, highly developed machinery. We have a very good process engineering project management and also assembly and direction. <clears throat> is today very, very important. The timber we are using, there are different types of timber. Again, all the timber we are using today is PFC or FSC certificated, which is very, very important. Also, <coughs> to fight against our competitive materials like steel and concrete. We have a sustainable material, they haven't. The timber all the time is kiln dried. We are losing glulam in very high strength classes, LVL, Kerto, OSB, 
Leno is a special material I will show you later on, and sometimes also hardwoods. Working on wood today means it has to be perfect matched, efficient and economic and just in time, and that means you need really good stuff to work on it and some specialized machinery. Sorry, was the wrong? The factory of Finforest Merck is in the south of Germany, near to Munich. Just some brief comments to the factory. It looks like a concrete factory, but it's a timber factory. Maybe some of you have visited it, as I know. Uh, but inside, it's a concrete building. That's what's happening inside is important, not the buildings themselves. Inside the factory, we have many specialized machineries. This is, for example, the area where we can cut big LVL boards, where we can send them, bring them in the right shape. A special robot machinery. <coughs> Sorry, this is one of our key machines we are using. It gives us the possibility to think three-dimensional, also <coughs> in timber structures, which is something might be quite new. Timber is no longer a two-dimensional material. It's a material you can work in three-dimensional shapes. And to do this, you need machinery <coughs> like that. This robot is free in five axes, so <coughs> he can cut whatever you like. Some other standard key machineries, big panel cutting machines, this panel cutting machine can work on big panels up to 35 meter long and up to 5 meter width. So really big dimensions are possible today. Again, timber is not longer a material which is restricted to some beams. You can really think in big boards and big dimensions today and use the timber in a <coughs> new way. Some press technology with high pressure possibilities a glue lamp press, a joinery is part of the factory to produce timber and glass facades. This is the so-called Leno production where we produce big boards up to 5 meter width, up to 23 meters long in different thicknesses to be used especially in the residential housing area. These prefabricated panels, they are glued together in a special vacuum technology which gives us the possibility to produce also <coughs> curved elements out of this fantastic material. You see it over in the right picture down there. This is a curved, massive timber element. So again, there is no restriction in the shape of a timber structure today. Some examples for possible thicknesses used especially in residential areas and that's how it works prefabricated perfect machined and quite easy to install and that's the way how a typical residential wall for a residential, a residential house is working today we have a solid timber panel we have some internal cladding external insulation, some ventilation, and external cladding, that's it. So it's very easy to work today with solid timber structures in the residential area, and you can do it up to four or five stories. There is no restriction in the stories. The only restriction is in the local regulation. In some countries, in some areas, you are not allowed to go for more than five stories. In South Germany, it's different you can do more than five stories. Here is again this robotic machinery working on a curved element. Erection process today, it's quite easy. You have these big panels, bring them on site, so one house is erected in less than one day. And it's totally different to the Oh, let me see my mouse. This was timber structure. Many countries in Europe, they are still working in this way. But we think 
these times are gone because the people there, the timber frame guys, they are doing a lot of work on site. They are not independent from weather. They are not sinking in prefabricated elements. So they are nailing piece by piece together on the site and that cannot be state of the art of a timber, <laughs> of a timber business. So our idea, and this is also something other companies are following us and that gives us the impression that the way might be right all the time when they are following uh, should be the right idea. Producing big panels, prefabricated, building systems, building elements, and to have a very restricted erection time on site with this fantastic solid timber material. Some example how it looks like typical South German architecture. It's nice, isn't it? Okay. No comments. Uh, another example for a more sophisticated architecture. Special structure, structures are also possible with these big timber panels with a wide, very, very big span. Public buildings like kindergartens, internal, really a very, very good internal environment for the children to play. They have timber everywhere and they have a very good environment. Prefabrication and producing elements is the main important thing on timber structures, to produce roof structures like that. Elements 23 meters long up to 7 meters wide, prefabricated, erected on site. This is something the timber industry can do today and we do it quite often to produce buildings as you see it here. Another area we are working on is timber and glass facade structures. All these facade structures are made out of timber and glass. Very slender, very stylish columns and transoms. You have at the end the same dimensions as you have on steel and aluminium facades, but the structure of the facade is made of timber with a special connecting systems and the glazing profile, which is an aluminium profile with some <coughs> capping and the glass between. It's really the same system as you know it from aluminium and steel and it's also possible in timber with all the benefits timber has. Working with prefabricated elements gives us also the possibility to produce buildings that can be dismantled after the use. This is one good example. It was uh, the pavilion, pavilion for the Vatican at the Expo. And this building was dismantled after the Expo and is used today as a Catholic church center. And this is only possible with prefabricated big elements screwed together, not nailed. And then you can dismantle the whole building and use it again in other areas. This project, a church in Heilbronn, designed by Peter Sherrett, is a quite good example how a timber structure can be prefabricated and create a fantastic church. The church has a perfect dome structure internally out of this three-dimensional shape with a natural lighting. So the whole church is made out of timber. The biggest problem was to find the piece of timber for the altar. It, we found it somewhere in southern France. It's one piece of oak and it is cracked today. There is a big crack in it now and sometimes they are putting the Bible in it, in, in the crack. Let's go to the biggest timber structure ever built in the world, the Expo roof in Hanover. It's still there. It was not dismantled after the Expo. Uh, it was too expensive to dismantle it. It was about 25 million pounds. 
the whole job and we had only six months time to do it. The structure is made out of three major parts. We have this big tower underneath, 23 meter high. We have cantilevered trusses, about seven meter high, 23 meter long. And we have double curved lattice shells on top. Each shell is 20 by 20 meter. Each pyramid has four shells and we had to do overall 10 of these pyramids. 16,000 square meter of roof. The production started with cutting some columns. That means cutting some trees in the black forest. Let them naturally dry, remove the bark, cutting them into half, machining them, which is not easy. You can imagine because this piece of timber is not really a piece of timber you can take some measurements on because the geometry is as it grows in the forest. So this was the first hurdle to take, how to machine it. And then at the end, these are the columns, the trees as they were grown in the forest, uh, to be honest, with some steel in it and some other additional materials. Without steel, it's not possible to do timber structures <coughs> until today, maybe we find something. The next step was to produce these big cantilevered trusses. These trusses are made out of an internal framework and cladded on both sides with big LVL sheets. Each truss is 23 meter long, 7 meter wide and with a weight of 32 tons. And we had to produce 40 of these cantilevered trusses in our factory. This is one half of a truss. There are hundreds of thousands of screws in it and ton of, tons of glue to make it work. And our guys, they worked three shifts in this time to produce this cantilevered trusses. And this is one truss ready to go from Munich to Hanover, which is about 600 kilometers. Uh, and we had to do this transport 40 times and the motorways were blocked because of the width. So it was by night. And then happy us erection on site started. This was the first tower, including rainwater pipes, bracing elements. After erection of the tower, we erected this big steel pyramid in between and then this cantilevered trusses which are really big dimensions. You see the guy up there standing here is nearly two meter high and double of my weight, but uh, he's really small if you compare it to the elements. So in the meantime, we had to produce the lattice shells. Because of the res restricted time scale, we decided to produce six shells at the same time. And the shells, they could not be produced in our factory because 20 by 20 meter is not possible to go on the street by lorry. <laughs> so we decided to produce the shells on the side, close to the building site. There was an exhibition hall. We went in and had six of these scaffoldings where the lattice shells were produced out of several layers of timber, glued and nailed together in this scaffolding to create this double curved shape. It was really a hard job, about 200 people working there for the six months to produce this fantastic timber structure. These are the steel elements where the shell at the end was connected to the steel pyramid and to the cantilever trusses. This is one shell ready to go on site, 20 by 20 meter, one piece of double curved timber. And then hopefully there was no wind at this day <laughs> when they erected this lattice shell hanging on the crane. We had some days with a lot of wind, so it was not always easy. But at the end, it works, and it's a really fantastic roof structure. 
And it's a good reason to visit Hanover, maybe the only reason. So, <laughs> sorry if somebody is from Hanover. <laughs> I don't really like it. I was there too many times for the expo. It's an absolutely fantastic roof, and it shows you the borderline what is possible in timber structures today. This structure would never have been happened without using computer-aided design. The house structure is completely drawn, three-dimensional, and going online into the cutting machines. So all the three-dimensional structures were computer-aided manufactured and uh, computer-aided designed. <coughs> this is the big advantage we have today. Another project, not really a building, just to show you what's happening in timber and what's possible in timber today. If you want to go from a 62 meter high wooden roller coaster, you can do it in Germany. Another project close to Hanover, 120 kilometers per hour, and uh, I would not recommend to do it after breakfast, do it before. But it's quite a very, very famous timber structure, and it's not temporary. We expect that it will be there at least for 25 years. All the timber is treated and impregnated. The double curved tracks were made out of Kato LVL, again treated by using this robotic machinery, which was again completely computer added design and going online in the cutting facility to produce these double curved tracks. So this might be the second day of your stay in the area of Hanover to go on the roller coaster. It's absolutely fantastic. And this was, I think, one of the first runs they did with our erection team sitting <coughs> inside, and I'm sure they remembered each screw and each bolt if it is in the right place. <laughs> Another fantastic project designed by Renzo Piano is the Padre Pio Church in Italy, the biggest pilgrimage church ever built in the world, 7,400 square meter. Structural engineer was Arab and Partners. And we did the whole roof structure of this shell so our job started on top of this uh, fascinating marble arches. These are marble arches, 50 meter span, the biggest stone arches ever built. And they were pre-stressed with three cables because uh, of earthquake problems in the south of Italy. So we started some weeks after this picture was taken, it was the first time I was on site, they did this fantastic arches there, massive marble blocks on a scaffolding, and you see a little bit this holes in the marble blocks for the pre-stressed cable. And this is the entry point for the columns. The columns were also part of our package, special design with a special shape, though there was absolutely no way to use any standard steel profile. Not possible when doing something with Renzo Piano. You can imagine. And these columns were completely made out of stainless steel, which was a very expensive thing. But nobody did discussions about money in this project, because the Vatican is paying for it. Nobody knows today what the costs were for the whole project, but yeah. They just want the best, and they pay for it. We have got all the money, which is uh, not something usual today on building sites. This is the three-dimensional computer model of the whole roof structure. On top of the steel columns, then we started to erect the timber structure, timber structure made out of glue lum, large, and it's a furniture quality of large glue lum without any knots. Again, the best has to be 
in the church for the Vatican. Fascinating project. The opening was last year in September. Unfortunately, the timber structure in the finished building is a little bit stepping backwards. You cannot really see it later on. You just see the internal cladding. This is the building as it is. Also, the main entrance facade is a timber structure. And here you see the internal view. You just see the soffit timber plywood and some pieces of the timber structure. But the whole three-dimensional timber structure on top you cannot see anymore, unfortunately. Let's go back to UK. Sheffield Winter Garden it was a good example. What can be done in timber today? The architects, Pringle, Richard Sherrod, and Herbold, engineers in London, their first impression was to do the structure in steel. And then we had some discussions and changed the whole structure to timber. We had uh, not really a good working environment. They did a lot of demolition work around when we started the erection, so it was not really easy to do it. But the whole Glulam timber structure, this is again a Glulam in large, started in April 2002. Yeah, I think 2002. Uh, and it took about six weeks to set down the whole structure. The whole building is glazed. It's a public space today. You can go in there, have a coffee. It's a fascinating project in the center of Sheffield, which is from the tradition a steel town. So it's quite good to have a timber building there for us. <coughs> Law Court in Antwerp, designed by Richard Rogers. <coughs> This project was again in the first step designed as a steel roof. All these pieces of roof, they were designed in steel and then we took the architect and the client over to Hanover and showed them what is possible in timber and then they decided to make the structure in timber. A double curved lattice shell the edge beams are still in steel because they want to have a reduced cross section. But all the infill you see there is a timber structure, a double curved lattice shell. The big roofs, they are about 18 meter high with an 18 by 18 meter grid. This is the deflection model out of the computer design. And this is again an example where we decided to make the production on site, not in the company, to do it on site because of <coughs> transportation costs. So the only thing we did in the factory was producing finger jointed, very long, high quality spruce boards. And then we went on site, not really on site, about five miles away from the building site where there was an old wharf hall and we had the possibility to have some heating facility in there and we could work in this wharf hall and produce the roof elements. The problem then was how to bring the roof elements from the wharf hall to the site. The wharf hall is close to a river, the site is also close to a river, so let's take the roofs on a ship and go this five miles by ship. Some days they had a really good wind so they can without using the motor. From the ship to the lorry, 500 meters to the side, and then the roof structure was there. It's a fascinating roof. I'm sometimes wondering if it's really good if you see the roof from this perspective, because then you are sitting in the law court, which is not something to be keen to 
project is nearly finished. I think the opening should be in the next month. Let's go to France, Benoit. <laughs> Business in France. Uh, this is a project in Miricourt. A school, the French government, they uh, made the decisions some years ago to double the use of timber in the public buildings until 2005. 2005 is this year. So a lot of new public buildings, schools and things like that, they are designed as timber structures. And this is a good example to show what is possible today. And again, you can imagine this type of geometry is only possible by using computer as design and working very closely with the architects, with the designers, with the engineers to make this type of structures happen. It's a school building with four <coughs> stories, without, nearly without any fire regulation restrictions. We have, the only thing we have, we had to achieve half an hour fire resistance, and that's it. So it is possible. Some countries have to learn a lot, especially for fire engineering on timber. One of the projects we finished last year here in UK, the new Cambridge University Library, a glue lump structure designed by BDP. Structural engineers were Whitby Bird and Partner. A glue lump structure, internal with external timber claddings, timber and glass facades, a very slender structure with this fantastic shape of the external cladding. And that's the atmosphere you have when you are sitting in the library to do some studies. I think it's quite inspiring there. This is again glue lamin in large. We are using large quite often because it's a fantastic material. If you compare it to spruce, spruce starts over the year under UV to get yellow to change the color, and it doesn't really look nice. Large does not really change the color. It gets a little bit darker, but it keeps his original red color of the large timber. So large is here a very, very good material to be used. This building is not published, actually. Uh, will be in the next issue of architecture today, I think. That will be the first publishing. This project is actually under construction here in London, the City Academy, with Studio E. A big school project, very demanding. Wilmot and Dixon, they are the main contractor, uh, partnering, private partnering contract, uh, and we did the whole facade structure. You can see it's a very colored facade and not really a timber exposed for several reasons, not to have any maintenance costs. But the whole facade structure is a timber and glass facade, so we have timber transoms and timber mullions. The project, again, is under construction, but it's actually a very, very interesting project. And uh, if you have time to go there and have a look, would be, I think, a good idea. You can see a lot about timber structures on this project. <coughs> and this is quite new. We are actually building our new office building in Finland. Uh, and it will be the biggest timber office building in Europe ever built. Four stories, 25,000 square meter of area we can use. And it is a timber structure, completely. The whole structure, the columns, the posts, the beams, everything is made out of timber. And we call it FMO, FinForest Modular Office, because we did a lot of research how to create office buildings for the future in timber and to develop 
modular elements that can be used in different projects with the same type of structure. And that was the reason to invest a lot of money in this structure. So again, the whole structure is in timber. There is no piece of steel and concrete in it. Some 3D animated areas where you see the modular idea, especially for the floors, the flooring elements, all the connections are modular. And that's how it looks like. It's on the way to be finished, hopefully in June. So we use the, the dark time in Finland this year to make it happen because everybody has time <laughs> during this time of the year. You cannot do <laughs> something more except drinking in Finland. So the building is quite demanding and we hope we can use this idea of modular timber buildings quite soon all over Europe, especially for office buildings. Some words to the company. Finforest is acting all over Europe, actually, also overseas. We, have, uh, we are working in 21 countries, mainly in Finland, in Norway and Sweden. Also, the company Moelven is part of our group. Finforest today is the biggest timber-based company in Europe, turn over about 2 billion euro last year. And we are working, you see this red area on top, we are nearly the only one working on so-called engineered wood products. So we are not only a producer of any raw materials or board materials, we are also thinking about building systems in timber and how to use timber in projects. I hope you have seen that there is a lot of innovation be done in timber industry over the last years. We have a lot of tradition and we have the experience to do it. And hopefully the Kyoto Protocol, which is in Europe working now, it is demanding, but we have the possibility by using timber to beat the high energy materials easily. For more information, please visit our web pages, finforest.com or merc.de. There you can find a lot of information about the possibilities, brochures to be downloaded. And if you have, hopefully soon, a project in timber, please call and ask. Ask soon enough after the first sketches you have done, you have to ask to bring the project, uh, let's say, to the right timber way and not to our lovely competitors in steel and concrete. Uh, yeah, that's it from the timber view. Sorry for being a little bit hectic, but uh, I have to check in in some minutes. So enjoy the day and thank you very much. Yeah, some questions, please. Uh, since Mr. Keller has to leave in a few minutes, we thought maybe some of you would like to ask a question. question I have, um, which is probably part of the general theme of today is you mentioned a lot that um, you work quite close together with the architects and the engineers yeah and uh, I think what what would be interesting for us to know is in how far that actually in in what manner that happens <coughs> and in how far that actually also relates to the computer edit design and computer edit manufacturing aspects so there's that great myth about 
fully integrated manufacturing processes and that the architect has only to send off actually his data and it's going to be sort of churned out of a machine at the other end yeah, somewhere. It's, it's but obviously with robotic uh, yeah. cutting and building, yeah. that's not so easy. Yeah. So I think it would be quite nice to have your sort of an insight into your yeah. experience in that exchange or the interface between yeah. architect, engineer and manufacturer. Unfortunately, it's in practice not working. The reason, therefore, is quite clear because when the architects are starting to doing their drawings, they do not really know the dimensions and the cross sections of the load bearing elements. This is something which is coming much more later into the structure, and then the whole structure, the 3D structure, has to be redrawn. That's the main reason. The only thing we can use is, let's say, the really basic geometry, some basic geometry data, that's okay, but the structure itself, the load bearing elements, the cross sections, the connections, all these things will not be ready when we start. So there is a lot of effort to do this redrawing again. And it's the same with engineers, because the engineers, they always have ideas how to do it, how the connection can look like, but they never know how to optimize the structure. And you know everybody has problems with budget, so you need always a value engineering and have to change things. So it's not possible. And the third problem is that the software that architects and engineers are using, they don't have a schnittstelle. Mm. They don't have an interface which can communicate with our machinery because there are only some softwares available which can communicate with this type of machinery we are using. Standard architecture software like AutoCAD or whatever it is cannot communicate with a robot. Uh, I wanted to ask you about the uh, properties of performance properties of your products. I mean, it seems that in the last decade we've gone to uh, a way of production where any shape can be produced in yeah. timber and very large. Yeah. Is it now possible to control, for example, isotropic strengths, that is, things that are stronger in one direction than another? You can. You can. And yeah. How do you control a fiber orientation? The fiber orientation, there are two possibilities. One is uh, with an X-ray, where you see the density of the thing. And the other thing is um, there are special, let's say, optical machineries available. And then you have a look how the fiber direction is. So there are possibilities which are, to be honest, starting now. We haven't developed this to an end. Maybe we'll come and talk to you about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, welcome. Any other questions? One more question, perhaps, if there's any. Okay, thank you, Michel Keller. You're welcome. Uh, we wish you good luck with your Finland trip and with the other activity yeah. that uh, you may perform after the dark. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, it's a great pleasure to introduce the next speaker, uh, Dr. Karel Follos, uh, who I met uh, in a symposium last year in the Netherlands, but with whose work we are actually all familiar. Um, he has been a project leader, for instance, for the Erasmus Bridge uh, with Van Berkel and Boss Hue and Studio. Um, and he uh, has started his own practice in 92 in Amsterdam, um, 
published uh, a book that you probably have all seen and that he will show you in a minute. I saw a copy here, uh, Twist and Build, which is uh, highly commendable. And uh, I think it was somehow a further extract of your PhD work, if I'm it informed was. correctly. Uh, very, very interesting. It touches actually upon all the issues that we're discussing today, and I can only highly recommend it to you. Uh, at the moment, he's also assistant professor at the Delft University of Technology. Um, leader of the, is that correct, Blob and Technology Group? Yes. Yes, it's a very uh, interesting title, very promising also in relation to the talk. Uh, besides those things that um, um, Carol Follos will be talking about, we share a great love uh, for Brazilian free form modernism, which uh, should hopefully make us hang out a little bit more, hopefully, in Brazil. Uh, to test what you do there when it gets dark. And uh, with that, I will pass it on to Carl Paul. Thanks. Um, after the wonderful uh, wooden uh, buildings we've just seen, you need not be uh, afraid of getting an overdoses of sustainability. Um, I'll talk on um, metal, especially steel, glass, and uh, plastics. Um, I will, I'm uh, representing Mick Eichhardt now, so I'm giving his presentation, but I work on uh, many of the uh, topics of the projects that uh, will be presented now. I will start uh, with Town Hall in Alphen aan der Rijn, designed by Erik van Egeraad. I will uh, mention a great variety of subjects, uh, um, from the, um, the management to um, production as aspects and assembly. Um, it uh, was finished two years ago. The design was made in uh, Rhino, which didn't uh, communicate very well with uh, the, the programs of the other um, of the contractors. And um, well, it was designed with wooden columns, uh, columns at, fir at first, uh, with twisted facades. At, uh, well, later it was all uh, uh, simplified. Uh, they became uh, steel columns. Um, it was quite a thing to make this uh, roof. It uh, cost the head of two uh, councillors, I think you call it, uh, Mounts, uh, the mayor and councillor. So two uh, uh, had to leave because of the higher costs of the building, but Mick Eichhout uh, survived quite well, um, being a good businessman. Um, it was um, then uh, drawn in AutoCAD and, uh, well, which did not uh, combine very well with the calculation program that the uh, steel uh, engineers usually work with, uh, StruCAD, so there were some nice variations there. And um, the model, it was simplified to uh, any directional surfaces, uh, a few cones, a few uh, cylindrical surfaces and flat surfaces. And uh, one can see by the diagonals there, somewhere in the middle, uh, pointed out later again, there, there was to be a twisted surface, but uh, we didn't manage to get that into the project. Um, it was um, a major problem to get a good insight into the, the, the construction costs of this building. Um, as it goes with buildings like this, there were two or three well, uh, a few more simple drawings um, indicating the variation in inclination and uh, thickness of uh, profiles, for example, which uh, suggested that uh, the work was quite easy to uh, produce and assemble. Um, this often is a major problem. The, the contractors, they, they want to be involved in a project by a well-known architect. They um, tender too low prices, they get it. The architect's just too happy to have it built. Then they get into problems because the, com the drawings, uh, when you start uh, elaborating on them, they, well, there's just an endless uh, variation on uh, connections and uh, profile length, etc. Um, in this case, uh, Mick Eichhout organized all the contractors uh, to protest uh, at uh, the client who was <coughs> the municipality 
and they managed to increase the price. I've seen it happen with the building of uh, Erik van Egerijt, where I took on the, uh, the drawing work, and I said, well, I just thought it would be a simple drawing because it was all uh, embellished of uh, flat surfaces, whereas I was doing in uh, micro station and a lot of quite complicated three-dimensional work. Well, the, the, the builder said, ah, you architects, uh, as I'm an architect also, just uh, do the drawing, this is the big man, man's world, and uh, we'll just do the building, just uh, carry on and, and, and finish it. And I thought, this is impossible. I took it on for three weeks of work, I thought at first, and I thought, well, maybe six weeks, uh, make it three months, uh, that's the, the negative thing. Then I would still squeeze out, and, but then after half a year, we weren't finished yet. Then I managed to pass on half of the drawing work to a big uh, American firm, Amec, um, who then lost about 20,000 pounds <coughs> in just the drawings. And um, well, as the contractor didn't want to go to the client to protest against, well, the, 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 the complicated, uh, the complexi complexity of the work, he just said, well, continue. So I just had to make many, play many tricks to get out of this. Um, and I survived it, but uh, he, his firm uh, went broke on it actually, later. Only because he didn't uh, want to believe it was so, would be so hard to produce and then assemble if the drawing was such a lot of work. Um, well, this uh, model was uh, engineered for a great deal um, by the different engineers who worked on the project, which was, uh, well, it evolved into a chaos. It's, it's horrible things that can happen with uh, a block. Huh? I'm just uh, rather skeptic about it often. It's the, they, they say it's the architect's dream and uh, the contractor's nightmare and the lawyer's par paradise because of all the, the things that go wrong. It's, it's quite amusing in some ways. But it's very hard to keep in uh, good control. I'll get back to that. Um, Mick used here elliptical, elliptical tubes that he had developed himself. It was a new uh, feature. He actually uh, <laughs> made quite cheap elliptical pipes just by pressing them down. He was able to uh, squeeze uh, a tube into a ellip ellipse. Um, as you see, almost all columns are different, all the facade profiles are different, all the panels are different. Um, it's not very clear on this uh, uh, photograph, but all the panels have uh, screen prints on them of uh, um, rose um, leaves. It's, it's quite nice, but they're all oriented in different directions, which makes all the, all the panels, except maybe 5% which uh, have anything of a bit of a series, but almost all of them uh, are different, which uh, implies quite uh, complex logistics uh, for one thing, and which was uh, the reason why we didn't make the twisted panels of glass also. At the time there hadn't been made uh, good uh, twisted panels yet, and then if you want to and transform them and temper them and then have a different uh, screen print on any or all of them. It's just too big a risk if something goes wrong, too expensive. Um, that's this part. Uh, he uh, triangulated uh, the parts to, to get around the, the corner here. Um, well, the steel construction of the, the main building was a different thing from the facade, which was made by uh, Octatube. And um, well, as he says here, states uh, only in two places, uh, they, they mismatch such a lot that uh, the, the drawings, uh, they, the steel structure, it punched through the facade, but well, that's, uh, it sounds quite nice, but it means that so many other places would have been different from uh, what one would want it to be, that it implied an enormous amount of measuring on the site. Um, the facade, in fact, uh, the, the, the square tube 
it was made by the, the steel um, contractor and then from that was hung the, the facade of uh, octatube and there were four points that had to be measured in every corner. This implied that uh, <laughs> two men were walking around uh, on the site uh, every day and uh, continuously uh, measuring. Um, of course this is, uh, well they, they got uh, the facade in quite nice but it's uh, from the engineering point of view, it's uh, it's a horror and, uh, to to have to work with so many <coughs> points that differ in <coughs> two directions. It's uh, very bad detailing. It's only it only happens in a in a phase before you really have uh, developed good details. I I think myself. I have made an own uh, facade system, which is much uh, simpler to. Um, detail which is in my book I might get round to show just the, the sense of it. <coughs> Here one can see all the, the leaves, it's not very clear they are leaves, uh, often it just seems a kind of condensation actually. <laughs> um, the idea was that it, well it, it works like that of course, it's a cheap way of uh, decreasing the amount of sun getting into the building. And uh, at first it was sold as uh, the, the, the shadow of the trees uh, that had been uh, taken away to, to build the, the house, the, the town hall. There had been uh, rows of uh, trees here which the, the neighbors, the, the surroundings, sorry, yeah. that uh, the people living in the neighborhood uh, liked very much and um, they protested taking down the trees so well then uh, Erik van Egeraad uh, just drew the, the buildings on the facade and uh, said, ah, but you will see the trees again. And uh, they should have been screen printed on the facade, but then he started abstracting them to uh, rose leaves. Okay. Um, over the roof, it's a mixture of uh, things I'm going to, I'm showing here. It's uh, the things one encounters when making blob-like buildings. Uh, these are called uh, spaghetti windows. It looks quite horrible actually, uh, the, the quite <laughs> irregular. I hope it's a bad photograph. It, <laughs> I think, yeah, maybe it's a folded uh, photograph, seeing the folds, uh, the creases there. Uh, um, it hurts almost to the eye. But um, here the problem was that uh, making these uh, lintel I think uh, shape over the roof that all the um, panels would have to be twisted and uh, well Erik van Egeraad had drawn all these panels separately and then um, indicated how much everyone would twist out of the, the, the planner, the, the flat uh, plane um, and then the contractor started looking for a, a wooden, uh, for a wood factory that could make the, the framings for this. But after, uh, well, three quarters of a year, the, the, the factory uh, resigned. He didn't want to take it on. It was much too complicated as all the, all the corners, they would be varying. And uh, it, it was, of course, uh, how to make this watertight when they, they were all um, in, on different inclinations. It was a great problem. And then make, um, copied an idea I had developed from, for a different uh, twisted building that is by called bending the glass. Glass can of course be bent, it, uh, it bends in the wind always. Uh, so if you, one can uh, make a, a fixed bending in the glass called bending um, as long as it's not too much. If you push it more it will uh, crack of course. Uh, if you just oversize the glass enough, then you can introduce a bit, um, bit of bending force in the glass. And uh, he made here the lintels here by having a U profile, continuous U profile on top of the glass, over the tops, and then one at the bottom end of the, the window panes also. And then you could just push in the, the glass pane at the top, then twist it, and uh, then pull it down again and then uh, he had a very cheap uh, framing system. It works. Uh, the panels basically are um, twisted uh, 50 millimeters um, on a 
surface of about one by, well, two meters high. And he got away with it. It's, uh, the reflections are not perfect, uh, which one luckily doesn't see because of the inclination. Because uh, a flat uh, panel, a glass panel, doesn't want to be twisted. It, uh, it won't double curve, so it will make a pro an approximation of the shape by just um, bending up some corners and bending down at other cor corners. So the sides, will, they will start curving. But he got away with it, and um, that's one of the strong points of uh, the firm Octotube of Mick, that he takes responsibility for the products he uh, makes um, and uh, finds unusual cheap solutions for things that otherwise would be quite complex and very expensive. It's a thing that is not always possible here in, Eng in England, I think, uh, with building regulations. The very much inclined um, paints, uh, well, the paints that would incline more than 10% I think will be um, um, laminated glass, so that if they break, you won't get the glass splinters uh, in your face. That's of course the big, big horror for to every big uh, glass manufacturer that a thing like that would happen, and then they are uh, they have much bigger liabilities than a small firm. Well, and then afterwards uh, he has he had a student doing a um, final. Uh, thesis on the uh, final, yeah, the, the, the master's uh, thesis on, on the subject of uh, cold bending of glass. Making uh, beautiful drawings. I, I don't believe in the conclusions they, they, they took, but okay. <laughs> Another project is the Hydra Pier. It was for a building exhibition in the, the Haarlem Meer for the Floriade. It's a big garden exhibition and it was a design uh, by Hani Rashid of uh, um, Asymptote in Architects in New York. This was the basic shape. It uh, was based on an aluminium shape with a V roof over it, V shaped uh, roof. It would resemble uh, yeah, the planes rising up over the water there in the polder. And one of the parts uh, was to have a uh, an um, aluminium roof and uh, at another point there would be uh, a glass um, yeah, kind of half bubble uh, kind of drop um, over the entry in the, in the canopy there. Here uh, after a lot of uh, engineering the double curved uh, parts were uh, reduced in the roof to only the two, two corners at the front of the helmet as we call it and uh, the glass was uh, here at the, at the front end, it was only singularly curved. Again, this was a very bad example of uh, how things were um, managed. They all did their own uh, engineering, and um, which resulted in uh, well, differences of uh, up to 20 centimeters, I think, uh, at the end. In uh, yeah, of difference between the the paneling and the or the drawings for the paneling and then the steel structure, which was inside it. Um, in the end, uh, Octotube did the the paneling on top of the the building, and the the glass here, shown, at the left, and the the bottom of the paneling was done by a major firm in Holland, Van Dam Gevelpanelen. It was uh, the best well named uh, factory for making flat panels. They went broke on this uh, project. Um, they at the same time had taken on another project that they had produced all in the, in the mirrored, uh, mirrored uh, shape. All the panels were mirrored for some reason. And uh, two of uh, prob yeah, problematic uh, projects at the same time were just, uh, they, it killed them. They had prepared it very bad also. Um, to make the double curve panels, uh, we made a, we used a process uh, production, uh, sorry, explosion uh, deformation. It's a very old uh, process that has been in used in the 19th century, I think, already. Um, it came back again in the <coughs> 60s. 
um, it was used for um, in the nuclear power plants or for uh, sh uh, space industry. So normally it would be too expensive for a building industry, but uh, um, I developed a process to, to use it for uh, transforming aluminium panels uh, also. Uh, the, the, the principle here is that you make a mold, and that of course is a quite expensive thing. If you have to make it from steel and mill it from steel, you put a, a metal plate on top of that and you seal it well, um, take the air out from uh, in between because uh, if you don't have a vacuum, the, the panel won't be uh, uh, touching the mold after the explosion uh, of the TNT which is uh, positioned on top. Um, because of uh, it being positioned in the, in the water basin, the, well the water will not press together eh? so it will have a very even distribution of loads on the metal panel and it shapes transforms very nice um, for this well this is the principle it's it's put in a water basin and then it all shoots up in this case uh, it was just a very simple metal fencing with a um, a sheet of uh, plastic and which we filled with water <coughs> and then in the, in the water we had the, the mold. The mold I had uh, made uh, um, uh, from concrete, self-densifying concrete so there would be less uh, air bubbles in it and uh, they had uh, fiber uh, strengthening to make it, uh, well to prevent having to make complex uh, um, strength, uh, strengthening. And we poured it in um, polystyrene uh, molds that, that were milled. Uh, well, there was a enormous waste around it, and, and we ended up with 20 tons of concrete uh, panels. But it was a, for experiment, uh, we don't care. And um, the panels, they were blast in shape very nicely especially the double curvature would stick, uh, it would stay in its shape and in the corners for example where it was more lean, uh, unidirectionally curved it would bend up uh, a bit again. We made um, a wooden jig uh, with um, metal uh, strips along the sides to um, which we connected to the, to the jig along the, the seams, yeah you can see it I think. Huh? We had those, um, the, the aluminium um, strips um, cut by, uh, yeah, by computer one might say. And um, by having um, the strips on either side of the, the wooden uh, jig, we were certain to have the, the, the seams at the right place and all the, the profiles in the, in the right direction. This is uh, a horrible, um, process in many ways as I, my vocabulary is not always very big um, because um, well it's not nice welding things to uh, a panel after transforming because the welding will introduce uh, um, transforming of course and uh, but it was a way to continue the system that had been used uh, for the rest of the panels because um, Hani Rashid uh, has a reputation of being a computer um, architect, uh, to put it like that, but it was rather, <coughs> yeah, well, I, I hate processes like that. He just makes a building and then um, makes a lot of lines on it which are to be the, the seams between the panels and there's no thinking about any functionality of, or anything of the production. Um, because uh, if you draw lines, um, it, it was kind of potato uh, chips uh, cutter, we call it, uh, orthogonal grid, grid over the whole building. And then if you have um, panels un that are under an angle to the, the grid, and then for example, have a cylindrical curve to make, cylindrical is quite easy, but then if you go and cut through a cylinder at the angle, it, it makes elliptical uh, uh, 
edges and it's uh, just for one thing. It, it, it all complicates uh, things very much. The flat panels, they would have uh, all different corners uh, yeah, that the sides would be folded to make them stiff. And they would all have varying uh, corners also. It's, um, it, it's not uh, a system designed by an engineer, but by an architect. Eh? And the, but as the architects are so powerful at first uh, still, at this <coughs> initial stage of blobs, um, all the producers, the pro producing companies, they tend to want to fulfill the de demands of the architect. And uh, they hardly dare to um, counter, uh, contradict him, to, to fight against him. Um, well, in this case, we uh, put the panels uh, over the strips. We welded them from the inside, which was a nice job, of course, at the small corners. We had a midget almost to, to have to, to fasten it uh, with a few, uh, uh, at a few points. And then we took the panels off and um, cut off the superfluous uh, material and uh, made a complete uh, weld. Um, measuring is uh, quite complex. Uh, if you have... Uh, um, a seam, for example, a distance between the panels in orthogonal view of one centimeter, then because of all the varying angles, the, the width of the, the seam, it, it will change if you start measuring, eh? not, not horizontal or uh, to put it, uh, or not in the orthogonal direction, but in a thing like this, all the seams would sometimes be, well, varying from one to three centimeters, something like that. So measuring is quite complex often. This, uh, the curvature is perfect. Here, actually, there's a funny mistake. Um, the, the people who made the drawings for me, they thought I wanted to work so precise that they um, didn't dare to make a, a flush surface, surface out of it, but they triangulated it. And the, in fact, uh, then the, the surface milled from the polystyrene was uh, triangulated also, and then the concrete was triangulated, and even the, the aluminium panel. It, it does show how precise we did work here. But it, uh, in fact, was a mistake. Huh? Only a little bit of um, uh, sandpapering made it flat again, and the, the panels were, in the end, uh, finished by uh, a, a car um, yeah, finishing... Uh, yeah, what you call it, eh? the people that paint cars and repair cars. And they did uh, the finishing of the panels and they were all painted uh, aluminium color. Well, one can almost get a heart attack from uh, a project like this, but and then uh, when it's made on the roof, you must, uh, well, you can only see it from a hundred yards distance and you can hardly see anything of all the details, which, uh, Maybe for uh, the first project is uh, a quite peaceful idea that people cannot see it anyway, but when you're busy on it, you, you just try to get it up, well, correct up to the tenth of the millimeter. It's, uh, it's just in the mind. Um, here the glass. <laughs> yeah, the <laughs> Mick doesn't make his own uh, presentations and the student who did it, he introduced a couple on the sofa just to tease uh, Mick. Um, here there are two kinds of um, uh, glass on the sides of the, the building. Uh, one of them is uh, cylindrically uh, curved, it's the end part, and then the other part it was called bent. I'm not sure there's another photograph. Uh, yes, um, here one can see it's attached uh, in the corner here, and then there are two points in the middle pushing the, the glass away. So here, in fact, a, a flat panel was made, and then it was, uh, it's about two and a half meters wide, I think. And then the middle of it is being pushed outward uh, for 80 millimeters. Um, and then the corners hold it into its curve. So this way one can make curved uh, surfaces for the price of uh, uh, flat panels. Um, of course there's a maximum to the, the curving and it's a bit, well it's more complex in the, in the sam assemblage, but it's a good way to save money. 
yeah, here the, well, the difference is uh, when the glass came, it didn't fit the, the rest of the building. It, it was, uh, there were, were some 20 centimeters missing, I think, which they had to fill up again. It, it's a horror, a thing like that. It, it, it was all, um, the project was started too late again, as, as those uh, projects would. Uh, which is nice sometimes for the contractors because then the price uh, can uh, can get higher. Um, and it was in fact uh, assembled in the in the middle of the winter, um, which is a horrible place, of course, when you're standing here alongside a lake and the, the roof isn't well. It's hardly closed, and they have to start plastering inside already to keep to the schedule. And someone else is trying to fit in the glass which came too late and then there's still holes around it and nobody can send back the glass anymore because then it will not be finished when the queen comes to open the pavilion it's uh, the, the practical practical life of uh, a block and then in the end nobody knows it's your own you only end up with the building and if the, it's a nice building that's the only thing that counts huh? <coughs> I'm a bit critical maybe sometimes this um, was to be, the idea was very nice again. It, there would be some 40 centimeters uh, of water in it at first, and then they, the water would drop down at the end of it, uh, at the top pictures you might see it, or the second from the top. Uh, there would be a, a curtain of uh, water falling down. It all has to do with the image of Holland and the uh, water. Well, in the end, it wasn't 40 centimeters, but uh, 1 meter 40 of uh, water, which was to be uh, hung from the construction, which was very hard to uh, to close the the seams and then it's not such a rigid structure as uh, would be with a aquarium. Yeah. Then the Rabin Center, that's uh, the nicest one, I think. It's um, by Moshe Safdi, quite a famous uh, architect who, in the 60s or beginning of the 70s, won a project, I think, in Canada. Um, a famous, uh, it's a living quarters with lots of different uh, variations of uh, apartment connected. He uh, designed the Rabin Center, uh, Rabin, the murdered uh, prime minister. Um, this was the design, which was not uh, possible to read it in at uh, any sensible program either. So it was uh, designed uh, new again. There are two parts, the library and the Great Hall. And the Great Hall has a span of about 30 meters. Uh, it was to be a free span. It's kind of pigeon-like, which is nice, of course. This was the, the tender drawing by Ove Arup, all made of uh, metal structures, um, pipes, um, all um, segmented from uh, cylindrical uh, parts, uh, tubes, and straight uh, parts. And this had then to, uh, had to be covered by uh, a double curved surface. It, uh, it's horrible, actually. It's, uh, it smells like work. Huh? So the thing to do is uh, what uh, all students like to do. They just draw the building, uh, draw a, a shape, and then say, oh, we'll make it from uh, polystyrene, and uh, we will mill it in the correct shape, and then we'll um, uh, put the finishing of, of uh, GRP, of uh, glass reinforced polyester. Um, but then here, with such a span, it was a great problem. problem eh? Quite some students uh, have designed uh, projects like that, uh, block buildings, um, and one can do a lot of calculations, but one of the big uh, problems is the delaminating of the inner and the outer surface uh, when there are really big uh, varying stresses on them. This uh, project, it, uh, yeah, Mick tendered for it, uh, for the steel construction. And then he uh, came with an alternative in uh, polystyrene. It would be one meter thick polystyrene and then covered with uh, the GRP, etc. cetera. Um, it would be one million uh, euros, I think, more expensive. On the, it would be two and a half instead of one and a half million. But uh, the client very much liked uh, the, the principle of it. it then the... Uh, the elements would be transported there by ship and then 
carried by a helicopter to the site. That was the idea, but uh, politicians didn't like the idea of uh, transporting elements like this over uh, the Palestines, who would have an ideal uh, thing to shoot at. So uh, that wasn't allowed in the end. Uh, models were made. Um, many studies were made how to make a surface and how to uh, m yeah, make a cheap surface without the milling, because the milling is uh, one of the more expensive parts. It's about, um, I think in Holland it costs about 120 pounds for um, one square meter of uh, milled polystyrene, and that's uh, including the material. Uh, this, uh, in the end, was made of uh, isocyanate, polyisocyanate. It's a kind of polyurethane, which is, has a better uh, uh, compression uh, conduct. And it uh, takes on the glue better than polystyrene, too. Um, after a lot of engineering, the thickness uh, has been reduced to 30 centimeters for the span of uh, 30 meters. It will all be made from... Um, um, panels about uh, three meters wide, two and a half meters wide, and there will be stringers in between, as they, they are called here. It means that all the, the polystyrene will be uh, segmented, um, well, cut by lines, and there will be uh, glass fiber reinforcement along the whole line, connecting the inner and the outer surface. And then in Israel, all these parts will be uh, glued uh, together and we'll get a flush finishing here are the stringers this is one uh, uh, these are two elements uh, they will be transported there by uh, containers of uh, it's a standard size but it's uh, the double standard size which is a standard also um, they've all been nested uh, they will be resting on the steel structure where the yeah between the or they will get ad additional strength from uh, a steel structure which is um, made of uh, yeah, cylindrical parts again. Here, yeah, they would be punching through the, the columns would be punching through the structure, so they have to change that a bit. This is the steel structure they will uh, make and then uh, assemble in parts there also. And uh, in they um, have uh, made the first uh, wing, and they're well on the way. I think in two months' time it will be all uh, uh, be transported to Israel. Um, here, Octatube did the whole um, engineering of the roof themselves, and that's a good alternative because then at least you know that uh, there's one drawing that everyone is working from. Um, well, the most, uh, most uh, important is that uh, there's one party who is doing all the, all the coordination. It, it might be the client themselves, it might be the, the architect, it might be a, a major engineering firm, it might, might be even a, a consultant, but it must be uh, one person who takes on the responsibilities. Uh, you probably know that Calatrava just uh, finished, uh, that there has just been finished the building by Calatrava, the turning torso in Malmö. It's a 190 meters high <coughs> building that twists uh, um, 90 degrees. And uh, that project, it was commissioned by uh, a building uh, institute, uh, the, the biggest one of uh, Sweden. And they, uh, they have about 70% of the houses in their, uh, in their uh, wallet. And um, this, uh, this turning torso project, it has uh, um, over uh, costs of, um, well, the, the extra costs are 100% of the building costs also. So it's uh, really, uh, you must be very careful in uh, what you do with blobs. Uh, but then it should be possible. That's it. Uh, that's me. I, I propose, since we have a few more minutes, that uh, Carl would show. I, I do have something here. Yeah. I must look it up. Yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, Nikos, would you have that? <laughs> <laughs>
Maybe, maybe in the meantime, uh, yeah, so would you back? Hmm? That can go out, and then I have it just from here. Just yeah. yeah. And we can just yeah. upload it from there. If you do it, maybe. Mm -hmm. Maybe while uh, Nikos is preparing uh, this, if there are some questions in the meantime, Mike, would you like anybody? Bege? Uh, um, I was just wondering, um, um, you were saying that uh, a engineering or a design process should be then um, led by one person or by one, yes, at least one organization. One yes. Um, but how, how would you, could you elaborate on the role of the architect and the relation between an architect or a designer and an engineering company if, if let's say, a process is initiated by an architect and on one point it, uh, there, there must be some kind of interaction, some kind of dialogue and what would be the ideal, like in the Hani Rashi project? Um, yeah, there are so many different possibilities in, in architecture. It uh, all depends on the architect. On, um, um, like Frank Geary, he would uh, have everyone work on the same CATIA program to have uh, perfect coordination even to the factories. A small architect can make a drawing, even in Maya, and then hand it to Ove Arup, who could coordinate it. it an architect um, like Foster, he keeps uh, all the whole measuring in his own hands and then passes on the files to the factories. It's, there are many variations, but uh, the, the main, Im well, that's the, uh, isn't that the idea? Yeah? Um, there are many variations, but the most important thing is that uh, there must be one drawing to work from um, and someone keeping an eye on it and uh, there are uh, yeah, different ideas of how to uh, to control a thing like that. Uh, one may, might work with slot uh, times that uh, everyone in turn has uh, a week to to propose uh, their solution, their part in it. Um, but then again, it it must someone must coordinate it and take responsibility for it. So some architects uh, can really come back into a more powerful position by by having the knowledge. Uh, still, uh, you must do it, huh? Maybe we can take one more question from Mike and then we have yeah. uh, a few more minutes on your own. I mean, it, it's sort of a continuation of the uh, same discussion. That most architectural training is to teach architects how to avoid taking responsibility. <laughs> um, and one very famous one in New York, uh, Greg Pasquarelli, the whole practice is in some uh, things orientated around where you can get the most geometrical control but take the least uh, legal liability. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if there's um, a possibility for a kind of intermediary person or some or practice of some kind which is geometrical coordination in, the, in these complex geometry projects. Yes, I, I think this uh, coordinator, geometrical coordinator um, can be stationed at many, at, at various uh, positions. He can be working for the client himself, like uh, the Calatrava building. It, uh, the person who is completely in charge there is the client themselves. And they don't uh, accept uh, the, the calculations by Calatrava neither. And Calatrava indeed made mistakes there. Um, other times, uh, Calatrava takes responsibility, for example, for some complex bridges uh, that nobody else would take responsibility for. Um, there, are many there are many ways to, to get around this, I think. It, it may be an architect himself also who, who uh, takes responsibility. He would like to be paid for it. Huh? That's one of the things, of course. Uh, um, Shall we? I'll, uh, okay. Just take a quick uh, look what it is.
<coughs> I will rush through here. Um, it was an, um, a lecture I gave at the uh, High Rise uh, Building Conference in Seoul um, a few months ago. Oh, sorry. Uh, And it um, focuses on the use of uh, twisted profiles. If uh, you just have an um, interior element or a facade for an uh, entry lobby, for example, of two, three stories, one can make a, um, a glass uh, structure, um, what do you call it, uh, without the, the, the profiles, with the, the frog fingers, uh, the, the, the point fixing, uh, structural glazing. Um, and then just have a meeting at the um, ceiling or the roof of just having a very small U profile in which the, um, the glass disappears. You might just even just uh, make a sealant there and that would suffice. Um, and, but if you want to make an office building, uh, one has to make uh, fire and uh, sound insulation and then one doesn't get away with just uh, having a sealant connection. Um, small uh, variations like this, they can be taken up in the, in the floor, but uh, one of the major problems, if you want to make a, a profiling system in a building, is that it's very complex uh, or complex or almost impossible to curve and twist at the same time uh, a heavy profile, aluminium profile for example. Um, another problem is that all the meetings of the profile with the floor will have varying angles and will um, arrive at different uh, heights. Um, which makes the whole uh, measurement extremely complex. It's uh, what one should not do. Um, there are different ways of uh, connecting uh, a facade to uh, a building. The right one on top, that's a very simple one. If you just have a, a round profile, then at least you have a standardized connection. The height will vary. Uh, the left one at the bottom, it's a typical shipbuilding uh, solution where you have uh, the, the, the framing, the, yeah, what you call it, uh, yeah, the framing of the ship. Uh, steel frames and uh, they will be welded to um, the steel hull. With, uh, with welding you can always fill up where the minor gaps and for a ship that, that works, but if you want to get uh, um, a segmenting of the glass panels, for example, one, gets com one needs different profiles. And that's why uh, I uh, propose making use of um, a twisting element like the red one and at the top there to uh, take on the different uh, angles and then by twisting the red element one would always have uh, um, an easy to twist element uh, to connect uh, to the, the curved or twisted surface. And uh, for example, an orthogonal profile that uh, um, connects parallel or at straight angles to the building. Um, here one at the bottom one sees how often uh, things are complicated by um, having a, a Y profile, H profile, I don't know, Y profile, uh, to connect to uh, paneling because uh, at some stage, like the yellow line, it will connect to the, the right end of the profile, then at, when it's uh, parallel, well, the, it will get closer to the profile. Oh, sorry. And then the brown one, it will move up again. If you take the center here, you will see that it uh, introduces a curve. And also, if you would have to work, have to connect this to the, the steel beam, um, it's, a, it's not nice because if you start tightening it, it will make a curvature in the, in the paneling. <coughs> Therefore, I... Um, um, developed this system, I invented it uh, and developed it with Alcoa uh, architectural systems. Um, I split up the profile in two parts. 
which uh, um, has one um, strong beam which is uh, curved or straight and only curved in one direction and connects at um, similar angles everywhere to the building and it has a very easy to twist uh, part that connects to the glass and they meet along this uh, cylindrical contact surface. So they all have uh, the same distance uh, to the axis of rotation. This is it basically. <coughs> this was the first uh, prototype and I, um, this was part for my, of my uh, PhD study. Actually I have photographs here now in which the, uh, the mullions are curved in, with a radius of four meters and the top transom is curved with a radius of four meters too and then the bottom one is uh, straight. And that implies that the whole, uh, yeah, all the glass is uh, freely double curved and that in fact uh, we now made the first window system for freely double curved facades and with the glass uh, fitting into it. I, I have photographs here, it's just that the being has been introduced this week at the B Dutch building fair for the first time. It will come to, in September there will be a, a lecture by, uh, yeah, there will be a small congress on, on complex geometries and they will bring the model to England, to London, so then I will be here for a lecture also. We may combine it. Um, well, to draw twisted surfaces, I made, uh, well, I, I forgot most of my mathematical uh, things also. Like all architects, they, after two years uh, from school, they only know Pythagoras uh, still, and that's all. Um, so I made a description which was not co conoid or hyperbolical paraboloid, which no one uh, understands actually. Um, but I made a new definition for a twisted surfaces, for a twisted surface. That is, you start, for example, with the red line, you move it uh, upward and you give it a horizontal rotation. So move and uh, rotate, they combine, they connect to the way of thinking of computer drawing and you don't need any formulas anymore. You just no, need a degree of uh, rotation and degree of movement. Um, in this case, uh, it will be a twisted surface if the movement is at a straight angle to um, uh, the rotation direction. Well, the facade. It's the old type. Uh, the glass is much better now. These are twisted uh, buildings one can make with them. Uh, so all the upright lines are straight, which makes them very easy to connect to the building. Um, and then there's a straight line and the curved line at the top. Curved, two similarly curved uh, um, transoms at top at the bottom. And one is uh, hollow here, the, the bottom one, and the top one is uh, curving outward. These are the effects that one will see. So cars will yeah, suddenly enlarge and then whoosh, disappear again. Um, uh, at straight uh, view from the front. Actually, one of those uh, facades we will probably be making in the, in the three quarters of a year. I think uh, if we're lucky, uh, that's uh, 250 square meters. It will be the first uh, facade we're making. And together with Alan Brooks, uh, who has been here regularly also, we um, are on the short list with uh, Atelier 10 now for a twisted building in Dublin. Um, for uh, the engineering part um, that will be it's a twisted tower for the pop group U2 uh, 60 to 100 meters high they're still we're still de designing on it this is another model I made 14 stories it's a uh, half a circle combined with a rectangle that's twisted uh, 90 degrees it has some horizontal lines just for the fun um, yeah I must watch time, right? it's not long anymore. Um, quite often nowadays in architecture one sees uh, inclined flat facades, but not uh, inclined uh, circular fa uh, facades. The circular facades always are vertical. Um, that's because if you incline a cylinder, the um, angle of inclination, uh, 
um, yeah, of the, the meeting angle of the glass to the horizontal line will be varying. Um, at the side, it comes down vertical, and then at the at the head of the building, at the end, it would be, for example, 70 degrees. So the profile must be twisting to take on the glass, and that's the reason why they haven't been using it yet. I think. Also, it's more ex more complex, of course, to make the glass. It's not anymore a rectangular uh, uh, pane that has been curved, but it would have uh, more complex sides. But that's possible to make. Um, so with this new profiling system, one might uh, make inclined uh, cylindrical parts too, which is quite easy. Yeah, quite a horrible building it is. Uh, not very proud of that one, but okay. This is another one. I call them sliders. You, uh, you take the plan and move it upward. It's a uh, sinus uh, here. Especially interaction of buildings would be very nice. And actually by having the the elevator and stairs and pipes go up vertical and then just move the, the plan sideways a bit you get uh, you have a great repetition of elements and uh, can make quite nice buildings I think uh, the inclination uh, angle is varying of course here but on every floor it's uh, a standard an inclination again a very good use for the uh, framing system this is a twin tower um, by Dutch architects. It's just the design, huh? and it's uh, yeah. I don't know what how to use the space in between, but it's a nice, uh, nice building. Oh, this one uh, we just saw. It's the back side of it with the vertical. I, I often draw verticals and horizontal lines to um, emphasize the, uh, the 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 shaping of the. Uh, of the volume, and here it's kind of Christmas tree. Yeah, all the cars that would disappear in into the into the air. Um, twisters uh, are buildings with a horizontal rotation um, that have a repetition of elements. Every floor is the same, so this is a way to cut the the cost to decrease the co the costs of the molds for the glass, especially the glass. Here it's 20 stories, 90 degrees uh, twisted with a cylinder to make it a bit more architectural. This is a real perspective. It's uh, nothing tricked here. This is an isometric view again. I'm uh, waiting to build this one. I've been waiting for years. And this is just uh, uh, the nec next step for when we make uh, a twisted profile that um, if you have the rotation axis inside the profile it will be easier to uh, ah, to to twist and bend um, but another aspect it and that's very important it uh, decreases the measuring of the building also because here you only need to measure the rotation axis and then all the other measurements are derived uh, from it. The, the panels, they all have a standard distance to the rotation axis. And it's much easier to make than uh, the model we developed uh, right now at the building fair, where one must work with offsets. These are two uh, uh, wings that um, rotate in opposite uh, direction around, around the cylindrical core. The cylindrical core will make uh, sta give stability and house the elevators and uh, things go straight up. And then all the wings, they are similar. They just connect at a different angle to this uh, core. And this is the frame we just uh, made. And I have photographs of the real thing now. Um, which in, uh, implied uh, twisting and bending the profiles, which is uh, just the thing one tries to not to do, of course. They had to make uh, new tools for this. That's the, um, that always sounds very quite intellectual, but I think, in fact, uh, when it didn't fit, they would just sit on it again and, <laughs> and bend it again, again in the good direction. Uh, for the second model, we will, however, uh, probably a uh, mill from wood, so from uh, cheap wood, a mold to, to lay the, the profile in to be sure that it has exactly the curvature we want. And that, of course, it's um, 
not cheap yet, but if you would use it for a 20 story building, then those costs are uh, very well, uh, one can, can do it. These were the panels we made. Um, the, the panels, it's quite a thing itself also. One can order the glass in, uh, at Krikursa, for example. Uh, they they uh, mill from ceramic materials, whatever it may be. It sounds very expensive, and the, the panels are very expensive. Um, and then they will bend the glass on top of the, the mold. The mold, uh, so yeah, it's, uh, it's, it will be a curved mold, and then you have the flat panels, you position them on top of the mold, um, then you put them together in the oven, you heat it, and then the glass sags down onto the mold. And we made very cheap, uh, relatively cheap molds uh, from cellular gas, which was uh, milled, and it doesn't last as long as uh, some more expensive ceramic materials, but it lasts for um, two, maximum three times bending. Um, so the, the glass, it's uh, perfect quality or good enough. And uh, we made them up to size on um, molds milled from polystyrene. So that's quite cheap again. It, of course, you again have the square meter price of the milling. Um, but then you're sure that all the glass panes uh, are exactly in the complex shape, which is uh, a great problem, of course. How can you measure, uh, yeah, a pane that has curves that are all over the place, but that, uh, that are very hard to relate to anything. Uh, in future, this can be done by a computer, one can say, one just positions it somewhere and then uh, reads a few points and then the computer will uh, position it in the, in the program and then it will be cut by a computer, but as that technique doesn't exist yet, one must uh, fall back on very uh, simple other techniques that um, basically do cost, cost money, but at, at least are much cheaper than making a machine that is not being used yet, or for too small a market demand. Oh, this is uh, uh, um, a master student who designed some things, and Geary design, where one could have used it, it's not being built. <coughs> you and studio design it. It hasn't been used yet, our system. <laughs> I've been busy for it for 10 years now. That's it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Carl. Uh, we we uh, keep our fingers crossed that the building fair goes well tomorrow and that the waiting will come to an end. <laughs> um, our next speaker, Mr. Benoit Fouchon, uh, if I'm correct, uh, is a civil engineer uh, of, of training and is currently the export sales manager of Covertex, um, where he has worked since, if I'm uh, correct, 1999. Uh, a company that came out of Koch Hitex, uh, one of two, the second one we might see later, both of which are located uh, on the beautiful Lake Chiemsee, uh, so we can only recommend you to visit. Uh, there's probably not too many reasons to go to Hanover, but there's many reasons to go to the Chiemsee, as we will see now. So please welcome Mr. Benoit Fouchard. <coughs> So now you hear me, okay. I prefer taking this one. Um, I will try to be to be quick. I think I'm, how much time do we have now? Is, no, it's fine, no, it's fine. It's a little bit dark. It's okay. Um, no, I don't think it's fine. It's just, it's only the color text logo. It's not very interesting. The pictures will be. 45 minutes? All right. It's, it's not enough, it will be okay. Um, <laughs> I will, be, I will be going very short uh, through two projects. We will 
mostly see project speeches rather than production processes. But um, as we have heard in the past lectures, there are a couple of issues with design engineering and a connection to the architects. So the first project I want to, well, um, no, this is first a slide on fabric structures, membranes, or cushions. Um, we are not talking of sustainable material here, it's uh, plastics. But they are all 3Ds. So whatever we do in fabric will be 3D, which means that we do need to work on computer model. And um, fabric structures membrane basically is a very, very old process. It's uh, one of the oldest one because it, since the very beginning, people have been living under tents. But the, the two days methods of doing it that's a little bit progressed since, and we are all now working on computer with special software. First project I will show you is our ETFE Cushion project. It's the Allianz Arena in Munich. Um, as you can see, most of it is written in German, but I will translate it or speak it through anyway. The difficulty of this stadium is a non-symmetry chosen by the architect. Um, is a twisting and 3D geometry of all the diamond to get on my mouse. Yeah, maybe it's this is, yeah, thank you. So all the all these cushions are uh, diamond and all are different from the size, from the geometry, the angles, the connection points, which means uh, in in a logistic an issue and in the design an issue. Uh, we see we have here the number of two thousand seven hundred and sixty cushions. We have one single axis of symmetry, which means one. we just have half of them are all different, with a total surface of twice 33,500 square meter, 73,500 square meter of cushion. Let me go through the building process. We just show from very start the raising of the facade in concrete, then there will be some steel parts for the steel, the primary steel of the roof. What you see in the piping, the facade, and slide, slightly the first cushions from the roof to the facade. So that now where we are, the snow, it's winter. Um, the complete facade is white. On the top of the roof, there are some transparent cushions. The reason for the transparency of the cushions is on the roof is that ETFA characteristic, main characteristic is a UV transparency. UV are good for growing of grass, plants, trees, whatever. Uh, on the football pitch, we have grass. <coughs> so the, uh, the south part of the roof is made of transparent cushions which allow the UV to go through the roof to the pitch to the grass, allow the grass for grow and thus um, save some money on the maintenance on the grass. Uh, if you know in mostly European stadium for football they have to, to change the pitch at every three months. Some of the stadium have a retractable pitch going outside to protect fresh air and rain. Otherwise, the cushions are white and uh, backlighted with some light elements, which we will see a little bit later. The geometry is made of, um, as I said, the wa one single axis of symmetry. Another one is all the all the the main architectural lines are in the diagonal and curved. So we also have here. Uh, double curvature. Um, ETFA or all kind of fabrics are soft materials, so we don't really have troubles in uh, twisting them. 
uh, in the matter of, uh, of the material itself. The, the, the issue is more in the design to find the right, the right cutting, the right geometry. Here you see the, the main lines. These are the main lines coming from the architects. So this is basically the base of our model to work. You, well, we, you will see we will have a real 3D model of, the, of all the diamond system, but that's all what we have. Um, we heard before from uh, Michael that he also mostly works on a very simple 3D model from the architect due to the fact that most of the time all the dimension sections <coughs> are not known. And this is the, this is the, same, the same here. We got from the architect uh, base 3D models and from these we had to work out our complete 3D construction of the cushions which have to implement uh, the thickness of the tubes, the width of um, the, the, the gutter between the cushions, etc. The basic geometry in a cross section, the cushion, the first cushion starts at a rate of around three, 350 meter. This has a safety issue that not everybody, especially in a football football stadium, you you don't you don't always have very quiet people, especially after the game. So for safety issue, um, the first cushion start quite high so that there is no possibility to have a direct access to them. And then they go all around the stadium up to the very end. The very end is one single uh, cushion, a special element. Further, there is underneath a sailing on the on the north and south and the north and white underneath the white cushions it's a fixed ceiling underneath a transparent cushion it's a retractable ceiling um, in order to allow the UV to go through but during games the ceiling is closed so the first is the feeling to being a closed stadium you, if it's open and you have a look through, you see all the steel, which might not be a very nice feeling. The second, uh, second reason is that this ceiling is a fireproof material. Um, again, with, with football, sometimes you might have some rockets going in the air. All, all around um, these parts, we'll, we have uh, ventilation elements and some um, open elements for any kind of services, pipes, ventilation, air con, etc. On, on the design, on making things work, uh, we, start, we started this during the tender phase. Uh, this project was more or less ten tendered in a design and build way. The tender documentation was not very big, a couple of pages and drawings. And um, we had to develop a way of um, working with this twisting system. As I said, for the fabric, the membrane itself, it's not a big issue. Uh, for the fixed parts, it's different. We, these are, basically this is one of the diamond and all these connection angles are indeed different and the planeity of this line is not the same as the planeity of these lines. So arriving there, uh, you arrive in a 3D direction which if you work, if you imagine a standard window profile which would be a stiff aluminium part uh, you will have to twist it, you will arrive in a different uh, angles and different planetae and um, so you, you really have troubles here to match all the nodes to achieve uh, water tightness and the third issue is being a big stadium there are some dilatation and movement so, um, which are quite big but at every 50 or 70 meter on the stadium which is too 
too, too big for us, so we reduce it to every node, which means every node is must allow for dilatation movement. So again, on the window profile, a stiff one, you can't really take dilatation. So the idea was to split these window profiles going left and right with an element to two different elements. These elements are made of soft material, rubber, which allows just to go around the corner, whatever the corner and the angle are, to change plan 80 from this line to this line, to go around this one and to move with this blade. Then in the middle, it's, we have a hole, but we are happy of that. It creates the gutter. This is the the secondary gutter lines at every every connections uh, ending into the main gutter system. This was all theory. Theory must be put into practice. First theory from sketches must be put into computer animation. This is 3D AutoCAD drawings and from there to mo real mock-up with maybe simplest material as timber, uh, plexiglass instead of aluminium, but just testing the reality of uh, the theory. This is another mock-up. This was a mock-up before, before tender or in tender phase for us. This is a mock-up after an uh, assignment of the job for the client with quite simple fixing elements but just to also show and prove the client that the system is working. Then last Christmas, I mean 2003, uh, we had to install a couple of elements for the client to see something and also for the light, uh, light, light people to make their test on the transparency and the cushion on the light. So we had the, the lighting elements is not our scope of work, but we had to work together with these guys to show and to see how we can print the fabric, the foil, to have the best light as possible behind. So here we see some, some light tests. Um, this is the first, the first test, first elements. What we don't really like in that is that we, we, we see too much of the, of the light, of the bars. The, the idea is to have a cushion which is completely blue, white or red without seeing too much of the light. So that's where we have to work on the printing and, and the decreasing printing on the old surface of the foil. Another issue uh, is the fire issue or some of what Michael told before Germany is quite um, difficult for that we have to go especially on, on fabric structures uh, we have to go through uh, processes uh, which we call in German Zustimmung in Einzelfall which means that you have to have the proof approval for your product every time you build something with a specific product which is not generally approved. So foil, cushion, etc. is today not a product like concrete or steel where you have a general approval. So you have to go through, you have to make big fire tests. And this is what we made. The advantages of ETFA uh, cushions, fabric generally, is that they are um, the B1 material to the German norm it is uh, self-extinguishing. On the uh, British norm, it is uh, BS476 spread of class, spread of flame class zero, which is not bad. Um, so the f basically, if you burn the fabric, the foil, it just melts away. If you put the flame away, so this is what we have here. You burn the flame, it melts away. 
as long as the flame doesn't touch anymore, it stops. There is no dropping, no burning dropping, which could propagate the fire. The, th the foil is very thin and a very, very light weight, which means that there is not much material to burn. Another, um, one way of seeing things, the other way of seeing things when there is fire is when it goes away, the foil is gone, it opens through the air which makes a very nice smoke extract. So you have a product, within burns, it's gone, it is open to the air, the, fire, the smoke can go away and the product doesn't propagate the fire. When we talk, when we saw the first slide, we see fabric membrane is a 3D geometrical form. Cushion is the same. The difference fabric to cushions, fabric are pre-stressed elements, single skin, which have usually twisted in two directions. A cushion is um, two skin product <coughs> inflated with air, making like a big bulb. Depending on the forces and the width of the cushions, um, you have more or less a big bump, or what we call the dip of the cushion. In the case of the stadium, we have very big, very big bump. This is due to first the size, extreme uh, big size of the cushions. The, the biggest one are 16 meter long by 80 meter wide, which is quite big for uh, ETF cushion, usually um, on s standard atrium roof here in London, uh, the cushions are 3 meter, 350 meter wide. And also we had to, uh, we have a snow load on Munich of 125 kilogram per square meter, um, which we have to carry on the roof, complete roof of the stadium being completely flat, so there is no drifting. What you see is an air pipe. Each cushion will be separately inflated. So there is an air pipe with four connections for each cushion at each corner. That means quite a lot of, a uh, couple of kilometers of piping. This is uh, a part view of the roof on the edges to the from the white to the transparent cushions. Again, this is the area, from, this is the south, this is the mountains, uh, border to Austria. So the sun is coming from this side, go there through, through the ETFE to the peach. The gutter line, the, the peach of the roof goes there and there. So all this water goes into this gutter line, some of these goes there, the rest goes there. These are the main one, two, there is another on the facade, three main gutters. But all the waters run and go its ways to the main gutter line. On the facade, for the lighting, we have a special printing, a decreasing printing, which is not to be seen by the eyes when you're far enough. You see the white cushion, <coughs> and here you see we start with a special printing from very white to clear to here quite clear. This is a printing, the very white one to the clearer one. This is a two euro coin, which is about as big as a 50 pence size. The result is better, still we see the light, but I think it's, it is, um, but it's still nice. Why these colors? The, one of the main, oh, I mean why the diamonds, why the colors? One of the main, uh, the main idea of the architect, Hector de Meuron, 
uh, was of course to do something quite different, to do something not too easy. But the, the blue-white diamond is uh, the, the colors on the flag of Bavaria. So Munich being the capital of Bavaria, this is fine. The blue and red colors are related to the two football teams playing in Munich. Red being the Bayern München, blue being the other one, but today they are in the second Liga and they might not be playing in that stadium. But this is another story. <coughs> Here a little bit the a better picture of the, uh, the, the backlighting and still um, there is a nice spreading of the lights. The lights are only there. There and there. There's nothing in the middle. There's the white. The white is very, very bright, so you see, but the white, blue, and the red one. So all cushions are the, th are the three colors, so they can play whatever they want with that. Back to the connecting system. This is the principle, a soft rubber like this, which would be made in the factory and bring broke on site like that. <coughs> an aluminium clamping device, which is just a holding part and can be omitted, cutted, so then it's no problem to curve. A liner to achieve the water tightness, as all these crossing points on steel are prefabricated elements. These ones have to be accurate, done with accuracy by the steel guy, so they are all different. Um, so they they will make done um, as prefabricated elements with the rotation put on side. It's bolt connection, so at every every bolt connection here, this is a special material we can glue on side and achieve the water tightness. These are dilatation joints for the here and there for the movement in that direction and in that direction of the liner. Dilatation joint for the liner. <coughs> the rubber is flexible enough to follow the dilatation. The system is a continuous rubber and a discontinuous aluminium clamping which allows them to follow the curve. The tightness is within the rubber. The movement is in that direction and slightly in that direction for the dilatation. On the facade, we have the, the roof. The, the roof itself, there is a dilatation in the steel with, um, pen, with bending, bending post. In the facade, it's only through, through the fabric. This is why this liner, which looks like a design liner, is only they are only um, for di for dilatation for expansion purpose. This also been tested. There's a mock-up in our factory. We've put an electric cylind hydraulic cylinder to on one side to modelize the dilatation, and um, we see that these parts are going nearer to each other. This is a plate on two hinges which can flex and we see that the rubber has no difficulty to follow this and through the cutting of the aluminium is no worries. The same on, the, on this point which will be this part here. It move in that direction so this will get nearer. And again it go through, we have cut a little bit the aluminium to follow. These kind of issues and processes were not thought at all in the tender. So when we're talking sometimes with correspondence with the architects, um, there were all the issues were not, not, not solved, not even thought of. So sometimes with some architects, there is a very early discussion where main issues are solved and sometimes it's um, 
a little bit more difficult. I mean, it's, it's really not easy. So it, it's, it's, we're not expecting that these architects can solve the problems, not at all. And maybe it goes a little bit too far also in the tender phase to do that, it might be. So it's, I'm not saying that the architects are not doing a good work, but a, a closer relationship is, is better in such a complicated project. Another issue on um, the stadium on the roof is the water. <coughs> and in case of de-inflation of the of failure of the air supply, the, the cash and de-inflate, we create we would create like a pool and this would be full of water. It, it's no worries for the foil, but the, the supplementary load on the water to the steel would be much too high. So we have a system of an internal pipe, which when it's inflated is up there. This is this one. It's sliding into a hole in the lower foil. And when it's de-inflate, the, the, the pipe is through. There's, it's open so all the water can flow down in the stadium. It's a stadium. It's open. doesn't matter if there's water in. And it just in case of failure. The air supplies, uh, what we see about the air supplies. So we see on the roof, everywhere, on every cushion, there is a pipe. Again, every cushion, the position of this pipe will be different on every cushion because it must be on the lowest <coughs> point. So again, 3D modeling of everything. I, don't, I won't be going on uh, the on structure. The machines, there are two, 12 machines like this around the stadium to, to inflate the complete stadium. In each machine is two ventilators. One is a backup ventilator. But there is already a security in case of failure of one of the ventilator. And there is um, also usually um, linked to this uh, uh, backup power supply like a diesel engine or a BMS in some buildings, BMS, etc. Um. The, pro the principle of the air supply is that we have um, a main supply from the machine. So we have one, two, three, four corner with each three machines, making the 12 machines. We have a main supply for the facade and a main supply for the roof r r along. And then we have the a s a secondary supply going to the roof elements and the same in the facade elements. And from then, each cushion will get a intake like this. So from these, one, two, three, four, go into each cushion. So we have around um, 7.4 kilometers of piping, of galva piping, and 3.7 kilometer of these flex pipes. Complete volume is 50,000 cubic, me cubic meter of air. The main supply of, of the facade going down along the stairs and then the secondary supply for the different levels, and from then again, this will give this one, this going, this one, etc. Here you see some of the piping. This is the mod this is the model we got from the architect, so the 3D model. Um, this 3D model gives us a coordinate point, but we have to search for it. So what we had, we have to develop a software uh, tool which will run automatically, automatically through the through all the model. This is an Excel sheet, put all in coordinate system, and from there give the the three D geometry of all the, the steel system go to our cushion. It's a little bit more complicated than that. It, it took quite a lot of time to develop that. 
but once it's done, it's very quick. Well, it's still a couple of months, but it's quicker than to have one guy just searching per hand every node. And this did not exist. So we had to a relationship with a sort of software industry and AutoCAD, this guy, to say, well, what can we do? So it's a little bit showing the way it was. Now when it works, it goes through all around, starting at the first ring, the second ring, the third ring, and take all the, that's taking all the coordinate, putting them, putting them into these. It's just a little part of the result. I think there were like thousands of data in that. So this is the, the simple line and we have to go to these corners which are defined by the height of the steel, the width of the gutter which we have seen, the position, the exact position of this black um, rubber and once we have that we define one, two, three, four point for the patterns which we have done in coordinate system to be to make it easier. Once the when all this is done, it is put into the AutoCAD. Um, what is good for us in AutoCAD, it goes automatically into the machine. So we can put direct from AutoCAD to the cutter, cutting the piece of ETFA into uh, one bay, or well, a part of the bay. The material is 1.5 meter wide, so by 16 by 8, we have a couple of them. The cutter is uh, also a pen to put all coordinate system to mark the position of the air supply, the position of the water tube, etc. And then it will be welded in the machine. The machines are full automatized with computer. Uh, the machine itself is running. It's a sliding machine on a, on a 50 meter long table. So we put the elements on one side of the t machine, the other side of the machine. The machine goes down and, and weld the two line, the, the two the two bay together. Um, it's like a zip elements. It's more complicated than that, but you will have more about fabrication later on. So, but we had 250 kilometers of welding in that project in that project. So it means the more, the more automatism you get, the more you can do in the computer, the easiest it get. But then on the machines, it's still running by men. So there are some details. All these corner details have to be done by hand. So it's also very useful to have people who still think a little bit. And um, they, they developed a lot of ideas and tools and tables and made themselves in the factory to make life be better, um, which we would, couldn't have done with a computer alone. So it's, it's the mixture of both. Transport on site, well, just stand up. Well, this is not the standard. Something we have to do is like inside there are some, some slides with the cushions, and this box just went back and forth from site to factory. The installation on the roof went over netting. And installation netting, no scaffolding would have been too expensive to do. So, but to do that, you need people having the right um, qualification, especially in the UK, Germany less. But in the UK, you need all kind of uh, IRATA, international rope access, all this kind of stuff. You see here the container with the slides and the cushions inside. You see the cushion with the integrated rubber. Here the, the, the screws have been pre-installed. This is where the, the aluminum clamping will be fixed. 
on the facade, well, there's only there's the cherry pickers, the possibility to do it. <coughs> This is the the ceiling, the retractable part. This is retractable. It's just on. It's just sliding. It's quite an easy. So now I've got another another reason to go to Hanover. So in the meantime, it would be really worse to go to Hanover. This is the another stadium. It's also for the 2006 World Cup. And. This is again ETFA, but this is single skin. This is no cushion. This is the first time to use um, such a big surface on ETFA single skin. And the, the development with the architect was also very special because it was not, has not been done before, really. So we had really to talk to them to have a close relationship and tell them, explain them how we would like to do that, but still being in a kind of tender phase. The main idea of using single skin is to use ETFE the same way as we would use uh, a tension fabric like PVC polyester or Teflon glass. The or the, the, why we usually don't do it is because ETF is only a foil with no tear resistance. It's not a fabric, it's just a foil. So you, if, you tear, if you tear a little bit, it just, just, just breaks. So we, we integrated a system of cable, of steel cable, into the foil to, to make it almost like a fabric. So instead of having a span of, here we have a 10 meter, by 20. So I think instead of spanning 10 meter, we only span one meter. So we have a cable running across there at every meter. So the, the actual forces, the actual width of the ETFA would be one meter. But it allows us to use it as one piece being 10 meter wide. The cable can be, depending on the size and the length, can be uh, put in the factory also. In that case they won't because it was too big. But we have made s a smaller project with a, f a cable net, like a spider net, where it has been done in the factory and shipped to site. The, the cable also 20 meter would be too, a too long distance, so we had to catch the cable at regular distance every four to five meter and this is why we have these cross beams. I think we have a detail now. This is a, a clamp connection to the cable and the, ca the, cab the cable is um, integrated into the pocket in the <coughs> ETFA. So it's really fully integrated working as well as snow load as a wind uplift. At the back, we have created, um, it's a linear clamping, so standard to any kind of fabric. And we have created a, a slightly webbing line for water runoff. And this is also possible with ETFA. So maybe now with glass, <laughs> but <laughs> with ETFA is no worries. So here you see very good the, the clamping of the cable. And it's very, very flat. It looks like single glazing if you look at it like that. The advantage is to do that is it might be surely a matter of double twisted, of twisted glass. It surely be less expensive to use foil. Again, UV transparency for the stadium. It's very important for the grass. This is the main reason why they have this boundary, this transparent boundary. The Arsenal Stadium is made also like that, but with polycarbonate or glass. I think polycarbonate for costing reason. 
but polycarbonate won't, won't do it. UV don't go through polycarbonate. Polycarbonate will be after 15 years white, or almost white, so you can replace them. It's costing, it, and, and it doesn't do what it should do. This is more expensive as polycarbonate, but it does work. Life expectancy is 30 years of ETFE, or at least the, the oldest projects are around 24 years, and still okay. It's a uh, ETFE, it's like PTFE, it's a Teflon family. It's a very, very resistant product. Maybe too resistant in matter of uh, environment, but you can recycle it to 100%. Well, this was the last slide on ANOVA and on these presentations. So if you have a couple of questions, if we have time. Yes. Cheers, start with one if uh, nobody has, has got one. Uh, one question that would be interesting is, for instance, whether you also were responsible for the primary structure in the Allianz Arena. And if you were not responsible for that, uh, how you actually negotiated liability uh, in kind of offsets uh, somehow in the structure that you would have to compensate for or not? Well, Answer to the first question is no. We didn't have to do anything with the prime. Hello. Yeah. First. Okay. <laughs> so we, we didn't have anything to do with primary steel or even with the secondary steel. So the the gutter you have seen with these cross elements were also done by somebody else. The only thing we had to we had to do is to make kind of of connection and um, for the detailing for what we want to have. Uh, but at the end of the day, the tolerances are the tolerances. There are norms for tolerances in the steel, and everybody says, "Well, we can give you that, but not more." We usually need less tolerances. So it's the responsibility then is by us that we have to have a system to match the tolerances if the steel is within his tolerances. With the system we had, with this rubber, it was not a big deal because it's quite flexible. Um, we have other projects, one of, one of them is here in London on uh, this, the, this train station, the new train station in Stratford for the Eurostar, um, where we are building an ETFA roof on a steel structure. The steel structure is not by us, the we have nothing to say nothing to do, the seed structure was even already in the fabrication before we have been awarded the job. So there is nothing we could do in matter of design and engineering, maybe to reduce and to optimize the size. It was too late. Um, the steel is on site. We have been on site a couple of weeks ago, and there is a lot of the steel which is off tolerances. And this is a real issue to have somebody controlling very important connection between two different works and um, on some jobs like that it makes sense that either the, the steel guy or the ETF or the fabric guy will be responsible for the complete job so secondary, secondary steel work to be given to the to the fabric to the glassing whoever it is makes sense to control the tolerances and the accuracy of the jobs because either it is not nice, it doesn't work, or you have a, a big claim on site who is responsible for what, which is more cost and delay, and etc. cetera. Um, I would have a question towards, <coughs> obviously in the, such an enormous project as the Allianz Stadium, a lot of actually the possibilities that you have are dependent on the machines that you can use. And you touch a little bit upon actually that um, your capacity to actually deliver the system that you are asked to deliver depends on <coughs> the uh, machines being actually developed for, for example, uh, well welding 250 kilometers of seams 
or something like this. So I, I was wondering, in how far does the collaboration between the architect, the engineer, and the manufacturer may even actually extend towards the tool builder that actually facilitates um, your manufacturing process? Um, regarding the regarding the stadium, we did not really have to to use special machines. So what the machines we had were indeed in in matter of production were indeed uh, enough for doing uh, this welding. Um, the the need of development was more in the design phase within the computer, and the. In, and in, in the factory, it was less in really technical advanced machines, but more in, in, the, in the people um, building some kind of helping tools for a manufacturing process, which might be very simple table adapted to the corners with, uh, if you have to weld, if you, you build like a tool to put your corners in with some movement. But on the welding processes and machines themselves, um, there was, in that case, not really nothing we really had to develop or to talk through with the architect. Um, I think at this stage, what we see in matter of fabrics and ETFE, we, there is not really something um, requiring better or different machines, uh, what we are. But there, there might be, there, there might be something coming. What, what we do, what we have done, I mean the developing of this clamping process, of this clamping device is completely new, was completely made for the stadium. So we have to develop new ideas, we have to develop new systems in order to match, to match uh, comply with the with, with system, with the requirement, with the issues on one job. So we have to indeed, so there is a communication, there is a discussion with the architect. There was a long discussion with the architect on how to, how to make the stadium, how to make it work, to show them the mock-up, if they want, if, it, if we can go in that direction. So there was, it's not like we have developed an idea and we have presented them and uh, are you happy, yes or no. There, there has been a development with them, but more in, in the direction of developing the details m as, um, finding new ways of welding. I think the, the question is not, is not bad and uh, there might be, or surely there would be good to have a, a thought and a discussion of new machines and new processes. It's a little bit more a matter of time for one, the architects and uh, two, uh, are we the, um, the fabricators to develop time and effort in new machines, but uh, I believe I believe there will be there will be in the future some some development. I've been, uh, I know I know we have been thinking and talking and seeing ways of uh, laser laser welding, but it's not really working at this stage. But it might be a way. It would be very would would bring very good new uh, facilities of making complicated welding, but at this stage. In ETFA, this is true, we're a little bit uh, limited to very quite straightforward um, welding through to these machines. Uh, I wanted to ask you about your uh, <coughs> research and work on uh, using it ETFA as a single skin membrane. And um, very interesting the project they use kind of cable neck system to reinforce that. I was wondering if it's possible or if you've done any uh, experiments with using pneumatic cushions to reinforce a uh, membrane so that you hybridize the two systems? Um, I, I, maybe you must be a little bit precise what you mean with reinforcing the membrane or what, what, do, you, what do you have in it mind? It seems that the, the limitations you were talking about were on uh, limiting the tear propagation Yes. On the membrane. And if in the system, instead of using cables, you use uh, linear cushions, I, w I wondered what the effect of that would be. And if that's a, a route you see, it might be interesting to develop. Uh, we never really thought of that. I think it's also a matter of costing. Uh, 
what we have done definitely is to use cushions with other products than ETFA. So we have done so far a big cushion in, uh, in Switzerland, which is a 5,000 square meter uh, bicycle stadium. It's one big cushion, it's 90 meter long, 60 meter wide. So there is, there is it's, it's, like a, it's like a big, big, uh, um, big, o big UFO. Um, on the top of the roof and there are some cables on top and underneath to sustain then the membrane because the membrane will burst through the, the, the forces. So air, air is being used in, in fabrics, in cushions, even I know of somebody using it in steel to reduce the steel, the, the, the steel weight. So using air to reinforce steel beams. Uh, we're working on some project on that. So air is a very interesting, non-visible, very light uh, structural element. Uh, but we haven't really been further than that. But in the future, I think there will be, um, there will be nice structures with air inside a structural element. Do we have any more questions? Perhaps this is your chance to exercise some friendly competition. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, or